business meeting. Could we all please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge the allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, do, do we have any adjustments to the agenda? I know I have one. Does anyone else have any adjustments? Meredith, anything? No. Um, one adjustment is we will strike um, item 7B, which was to be the um, consideration of the adoption of the visual and performing arts curriculum. Um, and we will do that at a future date. Um, all right, and so on to item two, approval of the school board minutes. Uh, I think uh, unless there are concerns, we can, uh, um, we can approve these in a slate. Uh, would anyone like to make a motion? Uh, sure, I uh, move that we approve the school board minutes uh, as listed in the agenda uh, item 2A, B, and C. Okay, do I have a second? Okay. Um, and any discussion or comments about the minutes? Okay. All right. Um, so all those in favor? All right. 7 now. Okay. Comments by student representatives. We don't have representatives from the middle school this evening. Um, and we are down one high school student um, who is playing um, lacrosse in the rain. Uh, so, um, Abby Donnelly, would you like to tell us what's going on in the high school? I would love to. Um, well, the, probably the biggest thing that's going on right now is prom, which will be taking place this Saturday at 8 o'clock at the landing, um, which I believe is in Scarborough, and that is very exciting. Also, this week and next week, AP testing is going on which is making students very stressed out. Um, but we have the achievement period, which is a new 30-minute period that they have inserted into our schedule uh, directly before the lunch period. It's a half hour where you can meet with teachers and clear up anything that you don't understand or just make up work or do homework, which has actually been very helpful. Um, mock trial went to nationals in New Mexico, and they placed 25th, which is directly in the middle, which is actually very good. Mm -hmm. And Claire Muscat won um, one of 10 Outstanding Witness Awards, which is, we are very proud of her for that. Um, seniors ha are starting their STPs soon, which stands for Senior Transition Plan. Um, so yeah, they begin those in two weeks, I think. And the science team did very well in their national um, meet as well. And I think that's it. Okay, thanks, Abby. That's great. Mary, can I add something to that about the mock trial team? Um, sure, go ahead. Uh, they actually did, if I can expand on that, uh, we came in 44th last year. To go from 44th to 25th is astonishing yes. in the second year of the nationals. And, um, I always get Claire and Emily mixed up, but Claire getting, I, I can only, I, I probably could guess, but there's hundreds of witnesses. For her to come in eighth in the country as a witness is a tremendous achievement. No main kid has ever done that. And plenty of individual main members got awards for best advocacy, best witness, best, and various trials. So it was really an excellent overall achievement. And also, we came within two to three points of of winning, uh, we came two to one, two trials, lost two trials. But one of those trials, we lost by like two points uh, to um, a very good team, and it could easily, depending on the certain judge, have gone another way. Which would, case we could have come in quite a bit higher. So I think it's an amazing achievement, considering it was the one of the most complex trials I've ever seen. Um, I, I help with the mock trial team. One of the most complex trials I ever saw. These kids had to do it while all the coursework went on, which was three or four hours a night for extended weeks at a time. For them to come in 25th in this country is absolutely amazing. Yes, I agree. 
So congratulations to that mock trial team. I think they did an amazing job here in the state. I sat through the states <laughs> along with um, Meredith came through for some of them and David was there. Um, uh, they were um, extraordinary. So I, I'm not surprised they, did, they jumped as much as they did in nationals this year. Um, they're, they've become polished competitors thanks to some very good coaching and some kids who have stuck with the program. So. So um, thank you, Abby. And let's move on to item number four then, and if there are no questions for our student rep. OK. Um, comments from the public on agenda items. Any comments? OK. Uh, we'll move on to item five, recognition. Pond Cove principal for the day. <laughs> Ten minutes. <laughs> I was counting on questions there. <laughs> oh, let me pull that one out. Oh. I started my day with a meeting with the team leaders. Okay. I started my day with a meeting with the team with the team leaders. They asked me about new rules, especially how much gum ki kids could do. They told me that they would like more technology in the classrooms and more <coughs> pencils and erasers. They also talked about me needing more space and windows. I got my laptop and Mrs. Omen showed me how to get my email. Then I greeted the buses in the rain. <laughs> I did morning announcements, then checked my email. I got one from a friendly spider asking if he and his friends would be allowed at school. Another email was from a teacher asking for help to solve problems at recess. I began my classroom <laughs> visit starting with kindergarten. I explained who I was and they asked me questions. The same thing happened in grade one. When I got to grade two, I decided that classes would not have homework and what they could have a few extra minutes of indoor recess if they behaved. <laughs> then I had to help a class solve some playground problems. They did not get extra recess. As I walked around Pond Cove, I checked for ID badges. If someone didn't have one, I gave them a temporary ID. <laughs> <laughs> I finished visiting all the classrooms, telling them that there, there was no homework tonight. <clears throat> then I went to the cafeteria and saw the kitchen <coughs> freezer. Mr. Espedito told me that he could use an a new dishwasher in that his staff worked very hard. Then I visited the middle school office and met the secretaries and Mr. Casey who had a clipboard like mine with him. Thanks to Mrs. Omen and Mr. Hardaway, I had a surprise at lunchtime. The kids could watch a cartoon while they ate. They loved it. Even the seventh and eighth graders got to watch it and they cheered for me. I ate lunch with the class and the third and fourth graders were very quiet while, while they, they ate and watched the screen. After that, I went to math lab to help Mrs. Butterworth because she has emailed me about that. Any questions? Questions? Comments? I was just going to comment that um, a certain second grader that I know thought you did a wonderful job today. <coughs> she really appreciated the no homework rule and the extra bit of recess. So nice job. This was a very nice debriefing. You did a great job. And now I, I have to ask a question I always ask, which is after doing this for a day, do you think you'd want to grow up and be a principal? Yeah. That's I great. Like that. Well, you did a great job, so I, it might be a good fit for you. Right. <laughs> you, can, you can talk to Mr. Eismauer if you need a reference. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Our next item is English Language Learners Cookbook. Do we have someone here to talk about their cookbook?
Uh, good evening. My name is Federico Giovine, and I wrote the uh, international cookbook here for the ELL program. And um, I started by uh, having a, a, an idea, which um, uh, came out to be um, an idea to raise money for the ELL program. But I also choose, uh, had that idea because I love to cook, and I like food too. And, um, and I also wanted to like, um, gather recipes from the uh, different cultures in this community. Well, then um, came the teacher's approval by Mrs. Seawitt, that, um, and she was ent enthusiastic about it because she thought it as an um, occasion to um, learn to improve my skills in listening, speaking, reading, and writing. Mm -hmm. uh, then came out uh, the research part, which uh, Peggy Thompson really helped us because she wrote a, a book, a cookbook herself, mm -hmm. and so we kind of shaped our book among hers. So uh, she was a really great help. Then uh, we made the, pro the actual file on the computer, which I backed up a lot of times. And, um, and me, Jack Duffy, the tech desk at the middle school, really helped us setting it. Then um, we started spreading the voice uh, and marketing by um, hanging flyers around, which is this one. Uh, uh, all the flyers all around the middle school. Um, and uh, Pond Cove, and then we sent email and also made an email, a cookbook email for the actual cookbook. Then we also, I also had, a, uh, luckily, a cook, a, an article on the Cape Courier, which is this one, uh, right here. This was the article. And I also I had an idea that Mrs. C would really love us to put little QR codes on here which would help people to scan them and then have an e a direct email con contact on their smartphones. Uh, um, after we um, did this step, we went to get them by um, receiving them from our inbox of emails and also uh, from papers from different people. And we reached our goal of roughly 100 recipes. When we uh, reached the 100 recipes goal, we started writing. And we first, I first started them by type by like main dishes, side dishes, and desserts. And then I also had to translate them from uh, Italian to English because my friends and relatives in Italy gave them to me some recipes. But the hardest part is was to, uh, ch uh, to like change the units from metric to American units, which is kind of the hardest part. Um, then we printed the first draft, which is this one. And uh, Mrs. Seawitt, uh, Mrs. Potter, and Peggy Thompson uh, edited it, and I revised it. And this is the first draft, as you can see, it's like a, a normal paper because we just printed it. Then uh, came the second draft, uh, draft, which is this one, which looks better. And uh, we still uh, edited it, and I uh, revised it. And eventually came the final draft, which is this one. And uh, I was really proud of it, personally. Um, and then uh, now uh, we, were, we were seeking funds before, but now we uh, got the um, great news that the MSPA and uh, uh, middle school grant um, offered us the right amount for the printing for the first 200 copies. Good. Congratulations. Any questions? Okay. Um, any questions for Frederico? So how, how can we get a copy of your cookbook? Uh, we're uh, planning to go to the printer by tomorrow or the next after tomorrow, and hopefully we have it done by Mother's Day or Monday after Mother's and, Day. And then will will it be available? We'll yes. Be able to buy a copy. By, of yeah, it? yeah. We um, we just got asked today to sell it at the um, the Pong Cove Challenge, Great. so we'll mm -hmm. set up a table there, and mm -hmm. Federico can sell them there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also through the. Uh, website that's, or the email that's right on the paper on your mm -hmm. tables, you can email us and we can get books to you too. Yeah. Okay. Great. Good. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Did you put any of your own recipes in there? Yeah. Uh, there are like my favorites from like my grandmother and uh, they're like around here, but then also I have like this part that's our specialties, which is like part and recipes that I couldn't fit anywhere else, so I put like a special part for them because I personally think they're really special. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, great. I'm looking forward to I getting a that. copy. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Thank you so much. That's oh, you're a welcome. very interesting project, and um, it'll, I can't wait to get my hands on a copy and <laughs> try some of your special recipes, or your grandmother's recipes, yeah. really. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, um, item C, doodle for Google image contestant, Isabel Robertson, is she here? Isabel wasn't able to be here, and I don't know if Steve wants to talk at all. I thought I would share with you Isabel's image, mm -hmm. and I certainly can pass this along. Um, I see Steve coming up, who can talk about um, the special recognition, but um, Isabel is an eighth grader at the middle school, and. Um, was a contestant in this contest and is our state winner. So I'll let Steve. Just a note on the recipe book. My wife's grandmother's apple Betty, which I'm now in charge of somehow down the line. I can't figure that one out. But that's in the book. You'll have to try it. Good. So. Great. <clears throat> um, there were, this is the fourth year of the Doodle for Google contest. It's a national contest. And there were, this year there were 114,000 entrants in that and the theme was if if I could be if I could be any place it's a futuristic kind of thinking but uh, as you'll see from um, Isabel's work uh, her place that she'd like to be at any time whether it was uh, last year this year or in the year 2025 is in the woods and she hopes it looks exactly the same way as it does today and she uh, talked to students um, at the assembly. Doodle, uh, Google came over and put on a very nice assembly for us. It was a surprise assembly. Uh, they handed out, I don't know, 200 t-shirts at the event and uh, uh, they, they had a very large, I'm going to say it must have been a 6 by 4, 7 by 4, something like that, display of, of her work and we're going to hang that in the school for a while. And then I was thinking of one of the other places here, right at the foot of these stairs. I remember uh, Matt Russ's work hung here for a number of years. That would be a nice place to see something. Like, it's just, it's incredible work. And, uh, and we kind of looked at it and we're talking with her about it saying, boy, you got that evil looking raven over here on the L and down here you got that cuddly little bunny. And, uh, and then there's something else that goes the other direction that gives opposite senses. And it's, it's just amazing work. Um, and so when she was in uh, art for the second trimester, um, Marguerite Lala Rohner had charged her students, she, she had 150 students that trimester and she charged them with uh, participating in this contest. And Marguerite came to me afterwards, she said, 150 entrants and there's only 120,000 or so people participating in it, we'll get a winner <coughs> out of this group. We did. So uh, Isabel is the, the main representative. She has a trip to New York City coming up, uh, all expense paid for she and her mother. Her mother visited New York as a youngster, was scared to death after her visit to the Empire State Building, but Isabel swears she's going to get her back, or, back up there. Um, and, and Isabel did a marvelous job presenting to her colleagues, uh, very poised, just, I think a lot of kids would say, I know her, she's kind of a quiet person, but to listen to her present, I think half the kids in the audience were going, okay, that's really interesting. So, we're uh, proud of her and her accomplishments. It was a great week for the uh, family. I happened to be up there at Chewankee also while her younger brother was uh, crossing the gulch and videotaped that for the family. So it was just a great week in their household, or outside their household too. Um, do you want to mention, you just mentioned briefly the, the filming, do you want to expand, expand on that? I don't know that everyone knows that, um, that PBS was filming. Um, Up to Chihuahua. Chihuahua. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I should also say with, with Isabel's piece that um, there's, a, there's online voting that you can do to support her as, as Maine's representative. And, and we figured out that uh, doing the math that every Maine citizen would have to vote 114 and a half times to balance out California, but we won't worry about that. <laughs> we'll just work at it. I've sent it out to all the principals I know and said, hey, get, let's get on this. Uh, and she also, if she is the national winner, it's $30,000 scholarship and there's $50,000 that would go towards putting a new computer lab in the school of the winning student. Uh, so I, while I was in the other piece you were just talking about is the visionaries piece, that was up at Chewankee. Right. 
So, um, you know, we, we've had a 26-year relationship with Chiwanki, and I was just talking to Joe Doan and said, you've been all 26 years, and he just turned 52. I said, that's half your life, Joe. He thinks he spent half his life up there. He, he just loves it. Uh, so there's uh, the National PBS has uh, a series that they're putting together of, um, I just guess I'd call it like local hotspots or national hotspots, things that what's happening, where, where's the visionary activity that's happening in, in education today. And so lo and behold, what's the place that they happen to pick but a nationally renowned outdoor experience. Um, so they, they were thrilled to be up there that week with our kids. They followed uh, Joe's group around one day, Charlie's group, uh, Charlie Carroll's group around, I believe, for another half a day. They interviewed several people, uh, students, myself, Joe and Charlie, and, and um, I think it was Michelle Gagne. So they, they were just saying to us, this is, we can't believe the things we're seeing these kids do up here. We didn't really know about it. We had an idea of what Chihuahua is, and we came here to get this information. And even though you hear it in advance, when you get there and you see exactly what they're doing, they were saying to us, we, we understand exactly why you come back here year after year. So um, that's going to be appearing in their national program, and they also have, the guy was telling me, there's an app for that. Right? It has to be. So there's going to be some kind of app that you can download from, to your, to your uh, phone and it will connect you to be able to see any of the uh, PBS Visionary series from there. And there'll be a link directly to, uh, off that Chiwanki piece, mm -hmm. to our website and information about our school program. Great. That's awesome. Yeah. Great it's stuff. really awesome. Yeah. It's a great week last week. Yeah. So, thanks. So Steve, will you be putting that on your blog when oh, it yeah. comes out? Oh, yes. That would be great. As they give me all the details, he said they, uh, we swapped contact information. So once I get all the details, I'll, I'll post that so people know what to look for. That'll be exciting. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Okay. So we will move on to item number six, communications. Um, and we have Ruth Ann Haley here um, to discuss the library um, along with Jay Sherma. Good evening. As I think probably most of you are aware, um, the Thomas Memorial Library's trustees have been charged by the town council with conducting an engagement process um, to make sure that the citizenry of the community are fully um, informed of the um, state of the current library project. Uh, Let me try this again. There we go. Um, Okay. 
We've got 20 slides here. Hopefully it's not going to take us anywhere near 20 minutes to get through them. Um, I'm going to start briefly with the background of the project. Um, for those of you who may not be aware of the fact, um, the project actually began um, with the new comprehensive plan for the town in 2007. Uh, a survey was done of all municipal properties at that time, and it was determined that of all the town's properties, the Thomas Memorial Library had been the last to be renovated or in any way substantially upgraded. The last upgrade was in 1985. Um, it was judged that uh, a study committee should probably be recommended to the town council for the purposes of reviewing both the facility and its programs. And in November of 2007, the town council did exactly that. They appointed an independent study committee uh, composed of members of the town council, some members of the board of trustees, some representatives of the Historical Preservation Society, and um, representing um, the foundation um, that supports the library. The committee was charged with um, conducting a national search to undertake the study. And Sorry, we've got a loose cable here. Undertake the study and uh, after issuing a public RFP, um, reviewed a total of 10 proposals, interviewed three of those consulting teams, and finally settled on uh, recommending the, town, uh, the consulting team of Himmel and Wilson to the town council, along with their partners, Casaccio Architects from Pennsylvania and Ose Engineering from here in um, Greater Portland. Uh, they were charged with assessing the library facilities, including space mechanical deficits, and to determine the nature of a library facility to meet community needs for the next 30 years. Um, input for the study came from the library staff, the Thomas Memorial Library Board of Trustees, the Town Council, the Foundation, Historical Preservation, and from the general public. Um, data gathering uh, was uh, accomplished through 10 separate publicly announced and open focus groups at which over 100 participants participated, a statistically valid telephone survey, survey of 300 randomly chosen um, households in the town of Cape Elizabeth, an internet survey conducted using SurveyMonkey for 683 representatives for a total of over 1,000 um, um, contacts. Um, uh, Full architectural and engineering review was also conducted of the building. Not surprisingly for any of you who visited the facility recently, uh, over 100 deficiencies were identified in the current facility. Uh, we've clustered most of them in, in this presentation. Um, and first and foremost is the non-compliance with ADA requirements. Um, throughout the building, aisles, aisle widths are too narrow, doorways are undersized. Uh, the in uh, lift system is outdated and nearly inoperable. Um, parts are no longer available for it. Um, the HVAC systems for the building are also deemed to be insufficient, uh, outdated, undersized, uh, resulting in poor air quality throughout the building, but especially in the lower levels. Um, and because of the structural um, style of the building, the fact that it was built over a period of 130 years, uh, the building is difficult to retrofit um, because of the way um, it's framed and because of the ceiling heights and uh, other inherent issues. Structurally, there are some major problems with the building. Um, Throughout the entire lower level, ceiling heights are deficient. Um, in fact, in many areas, they do not conform to code. Uh, the structural support for the building is inadequate, uh, most specifically on the children's side of the building. Um, and, uh, but overall, uh, and there is profound um, evidence of water damage throughout the lower foundations of the building uh, and incidences of mold and mildews. The electrical wiring and data networks are at and beyond capacity. Data networks are virtually beyond capacity. We are 
long since uh, relying on wireless and other um, sub uh, units to, to break out the uh, bandwidth. Um, we have an inefficient layout. The building contains over 30 rooms uh, located on five separate levels, which makes it a very difficult building to supervise um, and highly inefficient in terms of traffic flows. The circulation area, for any of you who have used the building in, re in recent times, is painfully inadequate for the traffic, um, but it is our only um, service entrance, and it is the only place that deliveries can be made because there are no loading docks, there are no um, entrances that are below grade. The study identified in the short term a number of things that really should be dealt with um, as soon as possible. Uh, the electrical mains in the system were found to be um, <laughs> deficient to the point where insurance companies would no longer cover them. Uh, those were immediately swapped out as soon as we found that one out. Um, but the Foundation issues remain and they should be dealt with. We have remediated mold in two separate parts of the building, um, but we have not done a full survey of the lower levels especially. Um, we have not addressed ADA issues because, quite frankly, the hope is that we don't deal with something piecemeal, but in one um, major undertaking. Um, nor have we implemented RF technologies, which is radio frequency uh, in the item, which is a, a current inventory control mechanism that is being used across the United States to replace uh, barcode technology because it embeds information within it. Uh, it's a very expensive technology. The actual implementation of the system would probably cost between $150,000 and $200,000 ultimately. Uh, until we have a better idea of what we're actually going to do, it didn't seem practical to us to start implementing that technology um, because quite frankly we have too many unsecured ways of moving materials in and out of the building. Um, there are over 40 windows in the building, all of which open. There are three major doors, none of which are alarmed. Inventory control uh, and security are simply non-existent. In the longer term, the consulting team was asked to study three separate approaches to the situation. They were asked to look at reprogramming of existing space, staying within our footprint and just trying to remodel, as it were, to maximize the efficiency of the building. They were asked to examine the possibility of reusing some of the current structure, but maybe doing an addition unto it. And they were asked to examine a new facility. In the end, they decided that they could not recommend a remediation of the current structure. Um, it was cost prohibited uh, anywhere between a million and two million dollars just to address um, the structural issues and whatever that I've told you about without any significant gain to the programming area of the building. And one of the things that they uh, found in a survey of the building is that we are inadequate in terms of space in the children's areas, young adult areas, computing areas, community meeting rooms, and staff areas for the building. Um, there is insufficient square footage for the historical society, which was part of the initial charge to us from the town council. Um, and the layout um, with the corridors that, and the connectors throughout the building uh, uses such a high percentage of the building's 15,000 gross square feet as to make um, the building um, difficult, shall we say. Um, the second option that they, they studied was the, no, the notion of reutilizing as much of the building as was structurally sound um, and simply adding additions to it. Um, so it's a, a kind of tear down and replace sort of scenario. What they found was to maintain the existing or the best of the existing structure was going to be an expensive retrofit for the reasons that I alluded to earlier. The structure of the building does not lend itself easily um, to modern systems. Um, and 
in doing that, we would perpetuate many of the inconveniences to the general public, especially those with accessibility concerns. The cost for the project, uh, as estimated in 2009, was five to $7.5 million. Uh, I should say that that includes uh, furnishing, that includes um, landscaping, it includes uh, teardown, um, those sort of things, a new construction cost. The final option that they were asked to study was a new facility. Um, there were two fundamental questions that had to be examined in that scenario, and one of them was a new facility on the existing lot or a new facility on some other piece of real estate. Um, a library the size that's currently projected would require anywhere from 2 to 2.5 acres of land uh, to be fully um, implemented with the parking requirements that are generally required in a, in a, in a town under our current zoning and um, habit, occupancy um, bylaws. In point of fact, the library with its two spare lots uh, is little less than two acres, so it's going to be a tight fit to do it there. But the cost of buying an additional two and a half acres in the center of Cape Elizabeth would probably add about two million dollars to the cost of the project. So it was kind of a no-brainer. Uh, if this is going to go forward, it's a new uh, piece of real estate, it's going to go forward on the same lot. Um, the advantages of doing a new building are, first and foremost, that it, it is able to um, address all of the identified issues, all the deficiencies can be handled in one swell foop, as they say. Um, children's programming can be addressed, multi-purpose multi community rooms can be addressed, service areas, supervision uh, can be designed into the building. And the structural uh, elements that are necessary for a library can also be addressed. Um, I should say, you know, just by way of example, that one of the issues in rehabbing the current facility uh, is most clearly demonstrated in the community room. Uh, for those of you who've been in the community room recently, you will recognize that's the room below the children's library. Um, first of all, the ceiling heights do not meet code. Uh, a tall man can uh, damage his toupee on the sprinkler heads. It is that low a ceiling. Um, beyond that, um, the part of the library that is most structurally deficient is, in fact, the children's library. Uh, unlike normal joisting, uh, when the library's addition was built, what they did was put what are, what are called hangers down the main carrying beam and then notched all the joists to hang off of that structure, thereby reducing the structural integrity of a 2 by 8 to a, essentially a 2 by 4 To address the problems of that room, the room would have to either be jacked approximately 16 to 20 inches, uh, so that steel could be introduced or the floor would have to go down and you'd still have the issue of having to introduce steel. Um, the cost for that alone in 2007 was somewhere between four and five hundred thousand um, dollars. So it's almost certain that whatever were to happen in the library, the children's library would have to go. Um, the drawbacks of a new facility on that lot are lot saturation. Um, it's an extremely, 23,000 square feet is an extremely large building on a very small piece of property. And the net result of that would be that inadequate parking would be part of the situation from the day uh, that we opened. In 2009, um, the study committee made their final recommendation to the council in October and they recommended a 23,000 square foot building. The cost is 5.1 to 7.8 million dollars. You'll notice that that's almost exactly the same cost as a rehab uh, with addition. And the ultimate decision of the study committee was if we're going to spend this money we might as well make all the problems go away and not perpetuate them. Um, in 2010, or I should say at this point, when that report was received, it was received by the town council but deferred. The reason they deferred any action at that point is because four of the councillors were going to leave and a majority of the council would be coming in new in January of the following year. 
So they did do that. In January of 2010, a new council came in in that spring during the budgeting process. They did um, authorize funds for a further design development um, undertaken essentially to provide materials for a capital campaign. Uh, and they authorized funding for a fundraising capacity study. Um, the intent being to actually find out how much private money could be raised in the town of Cape Elizabeth for a project of this sort and thereby reduce the burden on taxpayers. In March of 2011, uh, a second contract was issue, issued to Casaccio Architects uh, by the town council. It authorized them to do a survey of local business styles, to conduct a series of public workshops, and to develop revised designs using um, the Pond Cove Annex, if, if possible. Um, two sets of or two iterations of drawings and designs uh, were undertaken. Uh, the first was a, re or was a new build, and the second uh, was the uh, renovation with addition. Uh, the renovation with addition was ultimately chosen. It was chosen um, for a number of reasons. Those included the fact that, A, it preserved a historical structure that had deep sentimental value to many in the community. Uh, secondly, it reduced the footprint of the building. Um, by going two-story, uh, it reduced the lot saturation, enabled us to keep the building uh, essentially with its uh, frontage intact, which left us the green in front of the library intact, maintaining green space, um, and it didn't significantly reduce the amount of parking that would be available. The downside, of course, of that is what I alluded to earlier. There are still some issues in terms of accessibility. There will be two flights of stairs uh, that people have to deal with, but there'll be a central elevator. In 2011, beginning in September and finishing in early 2012, January, the uh, firm of DeMont Associates of Portland was hired to undertake a capacity study. Um, they developed the primary statement of need. They conducted interviews of about 90 interviews in total um, and issued a final report in which they projected that two plus million dollars could probably be raised in the community to offset the town's burden. I'm inclu including in this presentation the floor plans um, for the new structure. Uh, as you can see in purple, this is the upper level. Uh, the Pond Cove School has been maintained on the right and is the front of the building. Uh, the Children's uh, Services Department has been moved into that part of the building. The reason being that um, the cost of remediating the structure to bear the weight of the children's stacks is far less um, because children's stacks, quite frankly, are lower. And so the weight or the pounds per square foot don't need to carry quite as high. Additionally, um, it enables us to run a contiguous um, pattern into the, young, the new young adult area. In total, we've increased the children's and young adult areas by about a third, um, perhaps even as much as 40% um, uh, if we are, do it really wisely. Um, we have introduced uh, the, another one of the downsides about going two stories is that we had to introduce an additional 1,700 square feet of service area into the building to accommodate the additional restrooms, the additional uh, elevators and stairways. Um, to compensate for that, we reduced this total square footage available for collections and staff uh, by about 10%. Um, and we uh, we'll go into this project with a collection size at minimum main standards. Um, but we feel that that's an acceptable loss uh, because we do believe that there will be some offset to print collections as uh, the world moves in an increasingly digital direction. Um, oops, oops, go back there, go back. Mm -hmm. Oops. Okay, the lower level of the building, uh, the important things uh, that I would point out here is, first of all, uh, in the lower left, the meeting rooms suites. 
Um, it, it is actually one large meeting room subdivided by um, the type of doors that you see in many convention centers. Uh, and it will be one of four facilities in the town that would accommodate an audience of 150 people. Um, next to it is a um, computer and um, conference room. Uh, it's designed to be set up as a computer lab uh, for the general public. And it's also designed to be used for adjunct school services uh, like Evan Thayer's robotics program. Uh, a larger area for the historical society. If that area is in fact reduced in a future plan, it is our hope that it would become studio space. Um, that um, public recording um, facilities would be made available, um, um, video editing facilities, uh, things that um, might serve the creative community in the, in the town. Finally, we've located a lot of um, storage, mechanical, and service functions below the old Pond Cove school building because, quite frankly, we can't bring the floors to the same height uh, in the basement, so we can't have uh, anything that requires full duct work. Uh, an elevation of the proposed building. Uh, we have done everything in our power to simplify the roof line to keep it a vaguely New England um, design and the landscaping plan uh, as currently proposed. You see on the right that we have maintained the front green. It is hoped that we would be able to use that, uh, continue to use that for summer concert series. Um, the parking is as compact as we can possibly make it. And most importantly, we have done everything to try to open up the, the library to the public schools. Um, it is our profound hope that we can continue the relationship that uh, hopefully we have built over the last 30 years. Um, we firmly believe that libraries are an adjunct to educational services. Uh, we hope that we provide for the community early literacy training uh, and that we continue and support uh, our student body uh, in uh, after school activities and vacations uh, and uh, in curriculum support without being directly curriculum driven. And finally, we hope that we're there for our students as they become adults and start their own families. I would um, call to your attention that any of the original building documents or planning documents are available on our website. Um, and I would also like to stress the fact that these are preliminary documents only. Uh, and it is part of the process at this point, as, as the council has charged us, to make the public aware and to make the school board aware and all of your support groups, see if, um, any of your parenting organizations, that we will be conducting a series of workshops, public meetings and tours. We are soliciting public, um, public input in the process. And it's still very early in the process. If the building is voted, or if the project is voted to go forward, um, whether that is by direct popular vote or whether it's by a vote of the council, and that is still not absolutely determined, despite what the press would have you believe, um, then it would move into a building committee. And the final design could turn out to be something very, very different. Uh, the size of the building is still open to, to debate. Um, whether or not the historical society, for instance, remains in the building, whether we reduce uh, the friend's presence in the building, all of those things are still open. The most important thing for my visit here tonight and Ruth Ann's visit here tonight is we want to assure um, the schools that we strongly uh, want your comments and your uh, input in this process. Uh, as I said earlier, we firmly believe that the public library is there as an adjunct to education and to support our students and our teachers in their work. Um, and it's important to us that when you look at these plans, you say to yourself, you know, is this going to be adequate for supporting the curriculum in a non-school environment? Um, right now, when Evan came to us and he said, you know, 
I, I'd like to work with you in terms of providing services to, to my kids, you know, after school and, and in the evenings, we were happy to talk to them, you know. The truth of the matter is, we'll do it, and we'll do it to the best of our ability, but it's going to be, it's going to be a stress for us um, because, quite frankly, our space is so limited. Um, but we think that what he's doing is really valuable, and we hope you do too. Um, and, you know, we want to be able to provide tutoring space. The new, the new facility hopefully will, will incorporate it within the, in itself, tutoring space. It's important to us that the young adult space and the, and the children's space be reviewed because we currently have our thinking in terms of what kind of computer support they may need, but we don't necessarily know what it is that you're doing. Um, and so, in the, in the same spirit that I sit with Gary Lenoy on the tech committee when we do the five-year and ten-year plans um, for uh, state monies, uh, we want to continue that, that uh, working uh, arrangement. And thank you very much for your time. I would answer any questions. Uh, if you have any, I um, am greatly appreciative of your indulgence. I know I'm going long. Um, but uh, please, uh, Feel free to call me in my office anytime you want to do a private tour, uh, or I can arrange a tour for all of you at one time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jay. Any immediate questions or, um, um, David? I, I had a couple of questions because, again, we're a school board. We're not, we don't have any direct oversight over the library or right. the function. But I am interested in your raising the issue about interrelationship of the library with the school system. And I don't know, I think she just disappeared. Um, I, I, I had a suggestion from Meredith and a couple of questions that I don't want you to answer tonight. I just want you to think about them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's anything going on in the school system to work with the, the potential new library to see if there is some sort of interaction in terms of exchange of information, uh, exchange of technology, use of it through direct access or techno technological access or whatever. Um, I noticed there was a video room, robotics, um, um, tutoring space. There seems to me that there is some possible connections between what we're doing and what they're doing. Um, so I'd, I'd like somehow that we investigate that with them. And then I had just had some general questions, just looking at your, your I understand I, I, I'm barely visual about these diagrams, unless I have an expert to help me, but I, I just like, I'm wondering if you people are taking into consideration, or I'll ask you to take into consideration the, I, you're making it a lot taller, therefore I wonder whether or not it's, it's impact on the lighting and visual space uh, for the very close nearby school, whether or not it, it's inner, it, it's taking up or will have any impact on the the common play area in between the two. So I guess what I'm saying is, I, I think it would be very worthwhile for the library committee to work with the school board, but what impact does this building, never mind the services it could provide, have on the schools, both positive and negative? Yeah. Because I, I don't think any of us want to go down the road and have us have a problem, or you have a problem, which we could have addressed up front. Right. So that's what I would suggest. Right. Mm -hmm. I would just play back a little on your comment, David. Jay and I have met, we've had that conversation, we've talked about when it reaches a stage that he's ready so I don't to have, have to our library staff be part of the conversation or whoever else, you know, um, from the district makes sense to be part of the conversation, that we're very willing to do that. I'll help make people available. I know Jay has certainly expressed his interest in working collaboratively on that. Um, and again, I would say when it gets to the building committee stage and design pieces are incorporated, that will certainly, Greg, I know will be part of those conversations and, and, and we'll make sure that he's looking out. I think that's very helpful to say for the public because as a member of the public, I, know, I saw nothing about this in the newspapers. I read all this the first time. To hear the stuff going on in the background, I think it's important for the public to hear that and it's actually important for somebody sitting up here to know that that's going on because I'm glad to hear it. Yeah, may, may I just go on record as saying, I think you have an incredibly good superintendent. Um, in the 16 years really? that I've... I, really? really? I do. <laughs> I, in the 16 years that I've worked in this community, I, you know, I would have to say that 
my working relationship with Meredith is the best that it has ever been. I congratulate you. I think this is a very, very good choice that you've made. Thank um, you. We like her. We like her a lot. <laughs> and we do on our side of the street, too. I know. Oh. Jade, no, I know. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, John. I choose. <laughs> John. <laughs> because Michael deferred. Uh, Jay, I'm a, I'm a big fan of the library, and you can, you can check my fees. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> not certain about that, but I, I do my best to support the library system, too. <laughs> He's going to ask for more money now. Um, Actually, we're looking at getting rid of fines. Um, um, but I, I'd like to invite you to expand a little bit more on the, on the philosophical thinking behind your library design planning. This is a, a time when digital media is having a huge impact on, on um, library-related industries. The book-selling industry has been transformed. The music industry has been devastated and transformed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and there must be people doing very um, uh, forward-looking thinking about libraries and library designs and their places in, in, our, in our communities mm -hmm. going forward. Can you talk a, a little bit about, about that and how that's impacted, um, that kind of thinking's impacted the committee's work? Yeah. I think the key to it is flexibility. Um, the truth of the matter is, is that none of us really know what is going to happen. Um, whether it's five years down the road, 10 years down the road, or 20 years down the road. Uh, we do know that the uh, digitalization of, of uh, information, um, not just the book industry, but across the, the board, uh, is widespread and um, the impact is profound. Um, it's currently estimated that about 21% of Americans have an e-reader or have used an e-reader in the last year. It's interesting that only 11% of Americans have actually bought an e-book. Um, so that, that's an interesting dichotomy discrepancy that no one's quite sure what it means, but the implication may simply be that Americans think the current price point is too high and they're not going to play the game at eight point, what is it, about $8.4 for the average e-book now. Um, it may also be that what we're seeing is the development of parallel technologies. Um, in the same way that um, the motion picture industry was terrified of what the impact would be of television and, you know, 50 plus years later, both industries have found their market niche. Uh, the same is true of radio to a certain extent. Uh, it is interesting to note that the publishing industry published more books last year than it published in its history. Um, so paper doesn't seem to be going away per se. It certainly is shifting. Um, the mass paperback is probably going to be one of the fatalities within the next five years. Trade pap paperbacks will be the only thing left. Um, it is also true that publishers are moving to concurrent publishing so that the digital book comes out at the same time uh, as the uh, paper copy. Uh, but at this juncture, it really does not look like paper is going away. In fact, the buying pattern seems to be that the same people who are buying e-books are buying paper in exactly the same proportion. So that if, if you go to that section of the market where 50% or, you know, people are buying 50 books, e-books or more a year, those same people are buying 50 paper books or more a year. So what seems to be happening, as I said, is the development of parallel technologies. The other main issue is that there are over six standard e-book formats out there. And until that standard really shakes out, the public doesn't quite know which way to tip. We do know that tablet technology seems to be displacing e-readers. But we also seem to see a trend that says that when people move to tablets, they start reading in a different way, and they stop buying as many e-books. So, you know, there are some, as I said, very distinct cross-currents at work there. What I would point out to you that the 10 largest library projects currently under work in the United States today are worth over $684 million. 
Um, the University of Tennessee <laughs> Chattanooga is building a brand new library facility and it is not unique. Um, what we see happening is that there still seems to be a need for the library. Um, if for nothing more than, it's, it's no longer a matter of libraries being <coughs> repositories. It's libraries as cultural centers. And that's part of what the, the planning committee has been trying to take into account in their planning process. Um, the notion that looking at the baseline function of what a library has always been, and it, it really has always been about gathering and sharing. When you, when you really reduce all the functions that happen in public libraries, that at the bottom is what's, what it's all about. In gathering of information in whatever format it may occur, and then sharing that information for cost-effective and social reasons. Um, in these plans and in the planning process, what we're hoping to accomplish is building a building that is totally flexible, so that if the stacks eventually go away, in 30 years or 20 years or 10 years, that that space can be reutilized for purposes that ascend. Um, one of the concepts, or I should say two of the concepts that are fundamental to the way we are thinking about this building are the notion of tool cribbing and the notion of sandboxing, uh, which are two terms that, you know, kind of have flexibility to them and may not have been generally accepted by the, the full public at this point, but the concepts are simple. Sandboxing is the notion of demo space. The notion that a library would be a space wherein every e-reader that's currently on the market is available and the staff is acquainted with them and can demonstrate them. And as technologies emerge, that purpose continues. The notion of tool cribbing is the notion of libraries moving their collections into non-traditional materials. Um, an ex example might be um, the Topsom Public Library, for instance, has fishing equipment. And it does that because it backs right to the Androscoggin River, which for the first time in my life is clean, <laughs> enough to actually eat the fish out of it. Um, and so this non-traditional material is available. In a broader context, that is extended to the notion of providing, as I said, studio equipment, or providing um, more high cost uh, creative materials, uh, plotters, uh, laser cutters, that sort of thing, for the general public, uh, for their creative purposes. And finally, the last part of that thing is the creation and storage of local productivity and information and creativity. Local concerts become part of the streaming collection that the library has. Does that answer your question, John? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Great. You're welcome. Michael, thank you. Uh, sure. Uh, you know, as part of work, and I know we, you uh, mentioned working with the school, but I also I know you're working with, uh, even though we don't, uh, also working with community services, because I know um, the, also, the library has been termed, you know, not only a library space but a cultural center. So, any feedback or working uh, with kind of community services, I think, would help the, you know, the public mm -hmm. assess what is the role of, of the different buildings. And then, from our part, um, just from feedback, and I know um, you and I discussed this when we presented to the town council a few years ago, but. Um, if you need from us, uh, a lot of community members may ask, well, why don't, uh, why don't we consolidate the libraries? Why don't the schools consolidate the libraries? So I know, I imagine that's a topic you and Meredith have discussed, but at some point it might be helpful proactively to say we've looked at all the different opportunities, and I know um, that's a question I get a lot. Um, so as a proactive information, and I'm sure we, we've worked on that. But also, if you, there's some questions you get that impact the schools, if, you know, obviously let us know and we can get those answers to you so the public can be uh, informed. But thank you for, uh, mm -hmm. for presenting tonight. Thank you, Michael. It was a great presentation. And thank you, Mary. I feel a lot more informed at this point. I, it was all sort of nebulous for me until now, so I appreciate all of this, and I'll look forward to attending one of the public meetings. Are those going to be um, coming up soon? There's going to be a conversation at the end of the Okay. Yeah, that'll be the first. Um, we are currently 
looking at developing a, a number of neighborhood meetings, a number of meetings with particular stakeholder groups, as I said, groups like CEF, the parent associations, um, probably we'd talk, try to talk to at least the Rotary or some other representative of the local business community. Um, and as we develop that calendar, we will publish not only on our website, uh, it'll be on the town website, and we'll hopefully get it into the Cape Current right. or the Courier. The Courier. That can be difficult. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> good. Good. Any more comments or questions? Thank you. Thank you for um, coming in to present to us, Jay, and thank you, Ruth Ann, and thank you for all of your work. This is a tremendous undertaking, and um, we appreciate you coming to us and, and giving us all the information on, on the front end. I appreciate thank you. It. Thank you all. Good luck. Thank you very much. Okay, so we will move on now to retirements and resignations under communications. Okay. Did you skip over mission? No, no, no. no, that's, oh, you have an old agenda. The agenda has, um, Andrea sent an updated agenda yesterday. Do you have it, Michael? <laughs> can you Pick share? It up? Yes, we're going to get shaved. You can. We can share. I'm always behind the curve. I went yesterday and picked it up. I know. I know. I'm sorry. Um, Thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, so, uh, just a few um, retirements and resignations. We received notices from um, Patty Blankenship, Jason Bremiller, um, Tom Eismeyer, which we'll talk more about soon, and Susan Kramer. Okay. Thank you. Um, questions? Great. Um, superintendent's report. Okay. So first I just want to say um, this is Teacher Appreciation Week. And, um, I, I, and anyone who has spent any time in a classroom knows um, how hard it is to be a teacher and how tremendously hard they work. Um, it, it's not as simple as standing in the classroom in front of students for um, you know, a few hours a day. It is an incredible labor of love, and I just want to say thank you to our teachers for the hard work they do every day. Thank you. Um, at Thomas Memorial Library right now, and I'm sorry that Jay and Ruth Ann missed that, but um, uh, we have a photo exhibit um, featuring some artwork from students at our middle school, and this was part of a grant that Marguerite Lawler Rohner um, worked on through CELT, and CELT supported the purchase of some digital cameras, but there are some wonderful local nature um, photographs on display there. Uh, let's see, on May 22nd, and I think I have a picture here, but our high school baseball team is participating in a, um, what's called Coaches versus Cancer fundraiser, so their baseball team will be um, hosting Falmouth High School, 7 o'clock at the ballpark at Old Orchard Beach, so that's a great um, fundraiser, but also, you know, real benefit to the American Cancer Society. And the first pitch that night is going to be thrown out by um, CAPE alumni um, by the name of Colleen Martin, and Colleen is a soft, plays softball right now at Endicott College and is a cancer survivor, so that's a nice um, piece as well. We had a number of students uh, who received some awards in this year's National Latin Exam. We had five students who were commended to receive the Gold Summa Cum Laude Medal, and we had 15 other students who were honored. So um, given that we have only <laughs> a very limited <laughs> Latin program offering, I think that's a pretty remarkable accomplishment. So our compliments wow. um, to Mort Sol and obviously to um, the Latin students who participated. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jeff Shedd and Jeff Thorek tonight are not here. They're at the Western Maine Conference Student Awards Banquet, and Jeff Shedd is acting as MC for that. I'm sorry that we had to miss it. Wow. So I'm hoping we get some video footage. Um, uh, the high school on Saturday hosted the SATs. Um, again, that is <laughs> the one thing you She's missed, Abby. I, I can't believe you <laughs> missed that, Abby. Job. That was the one thing that She's um, trying to forget. slipped by. But um, again, a huge undertaking. And our thanks to the guidance department staff, to the faculty who rearranged their classrooms, to the many um, members of the faculty who proctored the exam. But um, again, everyone's breathing eat more easily now, um, especially the students. They had a great day off on Monday. Yes. Bonus. Last week, uh, I believe, 
lost track, all track of time right now. I can't believe that it's May. Um, I was able to attend a response to intervention conference um, hosted by the Maine Principals Association, and we had um, teams from our high school and middle school there, and it was just a great chance um, for them to think collaboratively about where they are right now with the response to intervention model and sort of plan forward. Um, we are also in the midst of our end of year assessments, so it's a very busy time and not only are our teachers working hard and adapting schedules and our administrators you know, shifting priorities and we've had substitutes doing some coverage to support, you know, for example, our reading assessments that elementary teachers conduct one-on-one. -on -one. Um, but our technology staff also is kept very busy because a lot of the assessments we do these days are electronic and it requires a lot of setup and prep time. So again, um, thank you to them, but uh, keep going students. We know you're working really hard too. And it's the end of year, so we have lots of upcoming events, concerts, and culminating activities. So I would just encourage people, I couldn't possibly list them all unless we stayed really, really, really late, which I am not recommending. Um, but visit the Google Master Calendar on our district website um, just to see some of the things that are coming up, ranging from the high school art show to the first and second grade concerts and uh, everything in between. Okay. Great. Thanks, Merida. Mm -hmm. There is one draw to the uh, high school arts Starting on Friday, there is apparently a, a picture of a decrepit old man in a um, oh bathrobe and sort of, instead of fine Waldo, it's fine David. Is it for sale? So I think um, <laughs> my my <laughs> son would sell me out in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> I thought Mary would like that. But apparently it's going to be on exhibit. I'm, I'm going to go for that reason. And actually. that reason only. Yes. More more. Thanks for giving us a heads up on that. Um, I, I would say, though, that art show is spectacular. You know. It is spectacular. So anyone who has the opportunity to go should definitely try and make their way over to the high school next week. I think it starts Friday, I think. And it's just one week, is that right? One moment. Let me check the master calendar. Um, <laughs> I didn't realize I'd sparked such an interest. Oh, dear. Just I have room. no idea just now. I can't tell. Yes. Well, it... it <laughs> It will probably be on the web, and it, it is definitely on the high school site. And I'm sorry that I don't yeah, remember exactly. Well, um, well, thanks, Meredith. Thanks for bringing it to our attention. Um, so, if there's nothing else, Meredith, we'll move on to item number seven: consideration to adopt the Cape Elizabeth School District vision, mission, and values. Do I have a motion? Elizabeth, I think you should make the motion since you were part of the team. <laughs> if you agree. I agree. Um, I move we adopt the Cape Elizabeth School District vision, mission, and values. Do I have a second? Second. Okay. Um, any discussion around that, Meredith? Do you want to give a... Sure, and again, I would ask you? Mary or Elizabeth to join in um, as they both have been part of this work. Um, I think we've talked about this a number of times. Yes. This work started way back in December um, and had been um, one of the things I think on the board's list from before I was even hired to update the vision and mission. Um, we've gone through some, um, started with a staff input session and community input sessions to get um, some general ideas of what was it that people felt the strengths of the district were, what was it that people were looking for, hopes and dreams, um, worked, took all of that feedback to the committee. The committee worked together to really study that, make some decisions about what should be included in a vision and mission, put together a draft, and then we went back through um, some feedback sessions and ultimately came up with this product, which is here today. So it's posted on the website. Um, it's included in the board packet we shared last time around. So. Mm -hmm. It's exciting. It's a first step, certainly, I yes. think, um, but I think it's a really important first step, and I think it, it's a great lens through which we'll be able to look at work as we move forward, to, you know, to think about strategic planning. I think it just informs overall the work that um, the district will be doing moving forward, so mm -hmm. I'm really excited about it. Yes. Anything to add, Elizabeth? I think it's all been said. Yes, I agree. I think Meredith said it all. It's, it is very exciting. I'm personally um, really proud of the work that was accomplished by that committee. We had students and teachers and community members, um, 
administrators. Um, everybody participated. Uh, we had a lot of um, data to go over. And as I said last time, the um, gratifying piece was that everybody was looking in the same direction. So, um, and I give a lot of um, praise to Meredith for leading that team through all of, um, through reams of paper. And I think what they called out was um, the gold from all of that data. And uh, it's a statement that I feel um, very proud to have been a part of. And um, thank you, Meredith. It's a really beautiful statement, and it's short and simple, and the hope is that it will be memorable to all the stakeholders, that um, kids and um, parents will be able to understand and, and um, look to it um, for what, uh, as a statement for our, um, what our school values and where we're, where we're headed. So. And I, I, can't, I can't wait to share it. I mean, <laughs> I know. we're just waiting for tonight, and hoping that moves forward because I we can't wait to get it out um, in the schools and in community letters and to the papers and yeah um, just have other people know where we're headed so. it's very it's very forward-thinking I think it's a um, very progressive statement so um, any other questions about it or comments no okay great all those in favor wonderful um, so now that we've approved it, I can say that um, in the this winter we'll be doing a TEDx program. For those who are familiar with TED, um, uh, we're going to be doing a program for the high school juniors and seniors. We've started the process for it, and we had to pick a theme yesterday, and we picked open minds and open doors. And we'll have four sessions. Um, the plan is to have four um, sessions of speakers and each of our values will represent one of those sessions. Community will be the first session and then academics, passion, and ethics. Um, so the speakers will all align themselves with those topics. So, so we're moving forward already. Wow. Great. Uh, Can't wait to hear more about that. Yeah, it'll be exciting. So, so thank you. Um, let's move on to item B has been stricken. Item C, consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations of the following personnel to continuing contracts. Um, I would suggest we do these as a slate. Um, I, I second that suggestion. Okay. Do, we <laughs> <laughs> do, do we have a motion? Yes, I, I move that we approve the superintendent's nominations of the following personnel to first continuing contracts as listed uh, in uh, item 7C in the agenda. Okay. Second. Oh, second? Okay. Did you have a comment? I was just going to explain that um, you know, for people who aren't familiar with the way continuing con the process works, um, teachers are typically hired. The, the, right now, the statute reads that the first two years are what are called probationary contracts. After two years of successful employment in the district, people move on to what's called continuing contracts. Um, during your probationary years, you know, as is laid out in our um, supervision and evaluation plan, there's a process in which administrators review performance and um, make recommendations to me, and um, and here we are. Mm -hmm. So, great. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. Dave. Um, just a clarification. The actually, there's a first year probationary contract, then there's a second, and then continuing. And continuing means they in essence, get tenure, Correct. Mm -hmm. just for purposes of educating the public. Okay. So we're voting to grant these teachers, uh, they, they finish the probationary status, and they're granted tenure. Thank you. Um, I think these are first year. No, these are, oh. these are the continuing contract, the first slate. Okay. But they're not, they're not tenured after this, is what I'm saying. I'm hearing they are. Continuing contract is is. Um, so I'm not sure why the word first is there, yeah, but that was an error. Okay, sorry. Oh. That's okay. Okay. You, you might want to. I amend my uh, consideration. <laughs> I know. Uh, please strike for the record oh, the word sorry. first. <laughs> I second. 
Okay, great, thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't. It's okay. I knew the teachers were under continuing contract. Okay, thank you. So, all, thank you for catching that, David. Well, he and I work as a team. <laughs> <laughs> all those in favor. Seven no. thank you. Okay. Um, item D, consideration to approve the superintendent's nominations of the following personnel to second year probationary contracts. Okay. Do I have, let's approve them as a slate again, and do I have a motion? Yes, I move that we approve the superintendent's nominations of the following personnel to second year probationary contracts as listed in the agenda item 7D. Second, please. Elizabeth. Okay, any comments? So again, these are teachers who have finished their first probationary year who are moving on to a second year probationary status within the district. Okay. Quick question. Yes. Uh, I noticed Rose Keneally is put down as 0. 0.6, and the next one we add a 0. 0.2. I assume she's becoming a 0. 0.8 as a second year probationary contract and not split between 6 That's and 2. Yeah. You are correct in that, but because it is a change to her current status, we felt it was important to separate the continuing contract moving forward and the additional time that she's being but hired in, for. In but terms of will... approval, she should be 0. 0.8, so my amender should make that a 0. 0.8 rather than a 0. 0.6. Uh, David, please change 0. 0.6 to 0. 0.8 in your <laughs> agenda. <laughs> <laughs> All right. But, however, I have, a quite, I have a clarifying question on that, though, because there's one move to move her in her point six position to a second-year probationary, but then the second motion would be to add the point two, which we have yet to approve. Well, chicken or the egg, which one do you want to do? Chicken. Okay, then it's point, then it's point eight. No, that's the egg. <laughs> <laughs> no, we can approve her as, we, we can approve her as point eight. The reality is you're approving her as a second year probationary teacher. The FCE status really doesn't matter in the eyes of the statute. It's just that she moves forward as a second year probationary teacher. And you're later amending her time. So um, whichever way you decide to approve it, it's still approving Rose's nomination moving forward to a second year status. Okay. okay. So we'll stick with. Um, Point six. Um, I don't. Well, I don't think it matters. <laughs> it doesn't. So. I don't think it does either. So. I disagree, but I honestly don't care. <laughs> I, I think you have to. But Which amounts to the same thing, right? <laughs> no, actually, it doesn't. But you know, <laughs> you know. All right. All those in favor. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, item number E, consideration of the following policies for second reading, GBEBB, staff conduct with students. John, um, I have a see, motion. Do you want to make a motion? Yes, I move that we approve um, the policy GBEBB, staff conduct with students. Mm -hmm. I second. Any discussion or? Um, well, I would just quickly say that um, the committee worked very hard on this policy, um, and so as did the uh, the well the board members of the committee as well as the administrative members of the committee who actually took this policy to staff um, and discussed it at length. Um, we also had participation on the committee from board members, um, not not regularly on the committee, so there was a lot of attention paid to this, to this policy. Um, and the reason for that is it's a very important policy. Um, we're trying to um, create very clear guidelines for staff conduct with students, um, and at the same time not, not um, inhibit um, relationships which are important to, to um, students' academic progress and performance. So, um, a lot of thought went into this, and and, um, and uh, it was also the the the, um, uh, the sense of the committee that um, this policy is really a, a sort of a starting point, um, and and the committee emphasized that um, it was important 
uh, that the schools um, have regular open dialogue about this policy and what it means. Um, and I think that was very well understood by the, um, the administrators on the committee and already put into practice as they um, took the policy to, to staff to, to talk about it as we formulated it. Thank you for taking that time with that policy. Thanks for all who gave input um, and um, worked to get it exactly the way it needed to be. Okay, all those in favor. Item F, consideration to approve the following new personnel nominations for 2012-2013. Um, it's a short list, so I'll read the list. And um, it's John Casey, middle school math, Andrew Lupin, high school math, Sarah Harrington, high school social studies, Joyce um, Nadeau, um, high school social worker, and Rose Keneally, high school math, point two. Um, do I have a motion, please? I move that we approve the following personnel as read by Mary for um, nominations for the 2012-2013 as listed as in today's agenda as item 7F. Okay, thank you. Second. Elizabeth. Um, any discussion? Okay, all those in favor? 7F. Um, consideration to approve the collective bargaining agreement uh, for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Administrative Support Personnel and Educational Technicians 1, dated July 1, 2012 to June 30th, 2015. Do I have a motion? Uh, yes, I move for that we approve the collective bargaining agreement for the Cape Elizabeth Education Association Administrative Support Personnel and Educational Technicians 1, dated July 1st, 2012 to June 30, 2015. Okay, do I have a second? Seconded. Okay. Um, all right, any discussion? I would just like to say uh, how appreciative uh, we were working uh, with the uh, representatives uh, from that bargaining unit and uh, Linda Alfiero who helped and um, that uh, both sides were focused on the same thing, uh, how to uh, improve in, in uh, student learning and um, we think it was a, a fair uh, agreement that um, continues to uh, uh, recognize the important uh, contribution those uh, staff play w within the school system and also reflects um, uh, you know the the need to uh, you know look look ahead in terms of how do we continue to motivate and retain uh, the highly qualified staff we're, we're fortunate to have so I just wanted to thank uh, the representatives from the bargaining unit for that and I'd like to thank Michael and Elizabeth for representing the board on that team Thank you. Any other questions about that or concerns? Okay. All those in favor? Seven now. Okay. Item H. Consideration to accept the resignation of Pond Cove Principal Tom Eismeyer and to authorize the superintendent to execute a contract effective through September 30th, 2012. Um, do I have a motion? Sure. I move that um, we accept the resignation of Pond Cove Principal Tom Eismeyer and to authorize the superintendent to execute a contract effective through September 30th, 2012. And do I have a second? Kate? Okay. Um, any discussion or comments? Um, I'd like to thank you, Tom, for your um, service. And um, if it's okay with you, read your letter. Is that all right with you? Um, Tom wrote a lovely letter to the board. Um, I am writing to inform you that I'm retiring from my position as principal of Pond Cove School as of September 30th, 2012. It's been my privilege to have worked with such dedicated administrators, teachers, and staff members during my tenure here in Cape Elizabeth, a community deservedly known for its support of quality education. 
I also want to support my admiration for the work you and your fellow board members have accomplished, and I'm sure the district, with Meredith's guidance, will be successful in realizing the goals of the new mission and vision. Best regards, Tom Eismeyer. So, um, all those in favor? Oh, I was going to no, you were going to say something? Yeah, I, I just want to um, thank Tom because I appreciate that, you know, uh, with this decision, he's also given us some time um, to fill an, a very important position in our district and that he is going to help us through this transition time, which um, is a significant piece, certainly, for all of us. And um, he has um, developed a really fine school, and um, I just really appreciate that. Um, so thank you. John. Yeah, I, I, I also wanted to say something. T typically, the board, we get these resignations, and we, and we don't, we don't, um, and we wait until another time when we have a chance to put together some thoughts and 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 speak. But um, I'd quickly just like to thank you, Tom, for creating a a, a, a wonderful environment in a school um, with our youngest learners that that I think feels safe and and welcoming for <clears throat> for all the students um, and and. Uh, personally, for me, it's it's meant a great deal to um, to be sending my students, my my children, to a, to um, a school where they feel um, welcome and safe, and and um, I I appreciate everything you've done to produce that kind of environment. So thank you, David. Uh, Tom, it's been I'm not sure if I can remember back when my son was in elementary school, but. I also want to thank you uh, for, for your excellent services to this community and, and to my son and to uh, Pond Cove. Uh, I, I truly appreciate it. I've known you a little bit personally as well as professionally, and uh, I appreciate the service. That, what did somebody say 17 years? Mm -hmm. That's a long time, Tom, and appreciate it very much. I'm sure there'll be many stories of Harry Potter days and, and different mm. <laughs> different things. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Let's not forget the trip to Japan. I know. Where's Tom now? Or your famous question to fourth graders at, at graduation, which way is north? I know. <laughs> I'm not going to give it away. <laughs> all right. So thank you, Tom. So all those in favor? All right, item I, consideration to extend the term of the teacher leader at Pond Cove through, 2012, through the 2012-2013 school year. Do I have a motion, please? I move that we extend the term of the teacher leader at the Pond Cove through the 2012-2013 school year. Do I have a second? Um, any comments? Um, Meredith, you want to give a little overview on that? <coughs> sure, and Tom, Tom can certainly help me more with the history, but um, excuse me, the teacher leader position um, job description typically calls for a person to serve a two-year term. Um, Linda has already served two years. This is the end of her second year. Um, but given the transition, um, Tom and I have discussed and discussed with Linda um, whether or not she would consider continuing on for another year, and Linda has, um, you know, been instrumental in some of the literacy work that's been going on at Pond Cove um, during the last couple of years. And I think, given the shift, um, we felt it just made good sense to ask her to stay on for one more year. So, because it's um, an exception to what's currently in the job description, we thought it was something the board should approve. Well, I know she spoke first. She answered my question because I didn't understand the motion. It's the existing. Uh, team teacher uh, leader. So now I understand the motion. Thank you. Anything else? I'd just like to say thank you, Tom and uh, Meredith, for thinking of that because that mm -hmm. will keep a nice consistency. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's, so thank you um, for doing that. Okay. All those in favor? Seven now. All right. Um, item number J. Consideration to authorize and direct the superintendent pursuant to 20-AMRSA chapter, subsection. is that, what is, subsection, subsection 14, um, 1486, 
um, two and 2307 to deliver the town clerk um, to the town clerk for display at all polling places the completed notice of amounts adopted at the town council meeting um, for voters at school budget validation referendum. Does so anybody else want to say, say that? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> no, I don't think I did a very good job with that. I'm very sorry. <laughs> I would, it's been a long day. I was going to second it, but technically it's sections, not subsection. Sections 1486, subsection 2, and section 2307. You want to make the motion then? Sure. <laughs> I have to do something today. <laughs> I move that we authorize and direct the superintendent pursuant to 20-A MRSA sections 1486, subsection 2, and 2307. To deliver, to deliver to the town clerk for display at all polling places the completed notice of amounts adopted at the town council meeting for voters at school budget validation referendum. Okay. Second. All right. Any questions? So, so I assume that town council approved the budget? No, that's, that's why one day, I, well, actually. Okay. So that, that, that's what I was confused. The town council is slated to vote on Monday um, because there's not a regularly scheduled board meeting between Monday and the time that the ballot has to be posted. We ask that you authorize me to post it in accordance with what they approve. Um, okay. And that is my understanding has historically been the practice that yes. the council approves and we post whatever they approve. Um, so and actually our next business meeting is on election day. So. Clarifying question, what happens if they don't approve the whole thing but just part of it? They approve a dollar amount okay. and that's what would be posted. Yeah. They can't line item veto it. They approve a dollar amount. Oh, okay. They either approve it or, or approve yeah. it or don't. So it's either a whole boat thing or not. Right. Okay. Yeah. It's my first year. I didn't know. It's okay. Actually. That's why Pauline's here because uh, thank God. Actually, get into any heavy detailed questions. I'm going to her. Actually, technically, they either approve the amount. They can't reduce or change. They either approve the amount to be presented or they vote no and we have to do it again. That's right. Okay. That's right. So, any other questions? Right, Pauline. Thank you. Concerns? No? Um, all those in favor? And um, so just as we're talking about the budget, the um, council is slated to vote on the budget on Monday evening at 7 o'clock. So board members who are able to attend um, just for that um, period of time that they'll be going over the budget um, are encouraged to do so. I think it's early on in the agenda, but you can take a look online and see. Okay. Um, item number eight, committee reports. Um, John, do you want to update? Or sure. Do you have an update ready? Um, yeah, I can briefly give an update. So the policy committee met recently with Ann Chapman from Drummond Woodson, who is helping us revi review and revise our policy manual, which is, um, is contains a lot of policies we probably don't need um, and may um, maybe better handled through um, administrative procedures. Um, so in our second meeting with Ann, we reviewed, we began to review the policies that are required by law um, because generally there is not much that we can do locally around those policies. Um, and so we're moving through um, those beginning with uh, the policies that start with the letter A. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um, and um, we will um, we will work through those um, first set of policies, and then we'll bring that group of policies uh, to the board for board approval um, once we have the final uh, committee version. Um, so we should, at our next board meeting, probably have a group of ten to twelve policies that we'll we'll be asking the board to to uh, review for first reading. Okay. Thank you. Um, school board agenda requests. Mm. Are, are there comments or questions? I I'm sorry. Just, um, now, uh, as uh, our, my, my hope is uh, for our next uh, finance 
workshops um, that uh, you know, now that the budget season knock on wood is, is behind us we look at uh, areas uh, either if you had questions from the budget process uh, or there were some things we identified such as contingency some kind of hope to do list so I would request everyone um, if you have any areas within um, how the schools are funded any questions in terms of planning any areas that you wish you had more information on if everyone would email me and then I'll lay out an agenda for our next uh, two or three budget meetings and I'll talk to Meredith about how that may tie into strategic planning but my hope is um, we really fill up the agenda um, and use that time um, for, for some other things. So if you have any ideas, thoughts, suggestions, if, if you would email me on um, things you would like for us to review or, or work on at, at those meetings. So, Thank you, Michael. I'm sorry I didn't mean to overlook the Finance Committee. Um, David. Just a quick, quick report on the uh, Insurance Task Force Committee. Um, we uh, currently have the one who was um, currently have sent out a revised for review by the entire committee a revised uh, proposal to get the expert advice that we may need to uh, perform our function it's um, it's out there uh, it took a while because I didn't get to it and John and will be um, excuse me Bob. <laughs> Something about you, John. Did I just call everybody John? I don't know what it is. Michael will be, will be scheduling a, a meeting fairly soon to try to wrap that up and, and get that process going again. There is part of the overlay of this. There is an ongoing lawsuit in federal court, which um, uh, has now been appealed to the First Circuit Court of Appeals. As to we've been given some information, but not as much as we need, and um, it's that we're, we're not pushing this process as fast as we could because. We need the information. We can't get the information yet. Um, so uh, we've done it. We're in the process of doing as much as we can pending the outcome of that lawsuit. Thank you. What's the, what's the earliest possible time frame? I mean, the, the lawsuit went as, as we might hope it would go, and, and that information became available. What's the sooner well, that it might become available? It, uh, I will answer it as best I can, which is going to be a non answer. It got appealed to the First Circuit in. Astonishingly, it enjoined the enforce. I mean, I won't go into the long legal details. We won, excuse me, the lawsuit by the MS Main School Management Association and others won at the at the state at the district federal district court level to require the information to be disseminated. Uh, one year's worth of some information was disseminated. An appeal was taken, and virtually unheard of. A temporary TRO was issued by the First Circuit stopping it. So until that TRO is heard, uh, um, and the result of that TRO, either we'll get more information or we'll be stayed pending the First Circuit making a, a decision on the underlying merits of the lawsuit. So I, the answer is there is no answer time frame for you yet, because a highly unusual move was done by the First Circuit. We thought we'd have information by now. But um, do we know when that move is being reviewed? The, the latest information that I heard um, at the end of last week was there was some possibility that it would be heard in July, um, but probably not to necessarily expect anything before September or October okay. in terms of a ruling. It, it's hard to predict what a First Circuit Court of Appeals will do and when, and nobody would have predicted they, did, they would do what they did. Thank you. Any other questions or reports? Or... Okay. Um, so now we'll move on to item number nine, school board agenda requests. Any requests? Okay. Um, announcements of upcoming meetings. Any upcoming meetings you want to announce? <laughs> uh, I'm thinking our May workshop will look at our um, physical education and um, health curriculum, so that that's an important piece. Two weeks from tonight. Yes, that sounds right. Good. Yes. Okay. So we'll look at health and phys ed, and that's also the night of our finance committee meeting. So, um, okay. Anything?
anything else you want to when is the next call? I was afraid you were going to ask me that oh. I, I'm not sure I don't have my phone either uh -huh. I want to say it's May 21st is the next policy committee meeting Thank Seven. you Meredith yes mm -hmm. always the one with the fastest answer Good morning <laughs> I know um, okay anything yeah. else no, I will just say briefly I know um, it, that we will be forming a search committee, obviously, to fill um, the principal's position at Pond Cove. So um, it, parents who are interested or in that process should watch for um, some information to come home um, in the upcoming week or two. So, okay. Thanks. All right. Um, so, may I have a motion to adjourn? That's nothing. I move to adjourn. Okay. I second. Um, okay. All those in favor? Thank you so much.